مساء الخير للحضور Good evening, distinguished guests. And good evening to the viewers of Sky News Arabia all over the Arab world. Today's session is on supporting economic development and reviving growth and shaping transformations in emerging markets and developing economy comes live from the beautiful and strong city Marrakesh in Morocco. And this seminar is part of the 2023 World Bank IMF meetings, which are being held for the first time in Africa uh, in the past 50 years. I will now switch to English because it is the official language of the meetings. Interpretation is available for all those who need simultaneous interpretation. A very good afternoon to all of you and thank you for joining us. My name is Lubna Bouza. I'm the head of business news at Sky News Arabia. And it's my absolute pleasure to return to Marrakesh, this beautiful city, and be part of the annual meetings for this year. 2022 was the year when the global economy was expected to recover from the turmoil unleashed by the pandemic COVID-19. But then another, another unprecedented event took place. Ukraine, Russia, war, and the economy was pushed into uncertainty. And today, we are witnessing another shocking tragedy. The tragic war that broke days ago between Palestine and Israel and its potential impact on the world. It's indeed tough time. Humanity faces so many challenges, starting from geopolitical tensions to economic slowdown, high inflation rate, high interest rate, energy crisis, technology war, rising debt, climate change. And that is for sure leaves the policy makers around the world with very tight policy space. So today we will be discussing that, and without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our distinguished speakers for this panel. Antoinette Saye, Deputy Managing Director at the IMF. Minister Nizar Baraka is the Minister of Equipment and Water, Morocco. As Sayed, Mr. Amr Sat, the Global Head Emerging Market, Markets Fixed Income at BlackRock, and Minister Magdalena Jetskowska is the Minister of Finance, Republic of Poland. Thank, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to start with you, uh, DMD Antoinette. Um, we know that um, the IMF has um, released recently a paper on what kind of um, policies structural reforms that policymakers can do in order to navigate this very tough economic environment. Can you elaborate on this paper and what are the reforms you think will help today? Well, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for <clears throat> this opportunity to talk about this uh, uh, very important new work uh, that we've put out. Uh, first to say, of course, that you're absolutely right about the, the environment that our member countries are confronted with. Uh, uh, slower gl global growth, uh, of course, uh, uh, severely constrained policy space, some having none at all, mm -hmm. uh, high debt levels, high costs of, high costs of servi servicing that debt, and uh, all of that making for a very, very difficult uh, a challenge around uh, investments that are needed to support growth and uh, you know, efforts to protect the most vulnerable uh, from uh, these turbulent uh, uh, shocks and times. So uh, this underscores, we think, the need to really uh, renew focus on structural uh, first-generation reforms. Uh, and those reforms, what are first generation reforms? Uh, those that um, uh, 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 present the most binding constraints on economic activity. And uh, uh, they consist of uh, reforms uh, on governance, uh, you know, uh, regulatory environments that may overly constrain people seeking to put in place new businesses and to run them and uh, external sector reforms uh, to reduce uh, trade restrictions, uh, to reduce, uh, to expand access to uh, uh, foreign capital 
as well. So uh, together, those reforms uh, can really make for a big push in, uh, in output, uh, gains in output if, if, uh, if sequenced uh, and uh, prioritized and bundled. Uh, they can actually make for a uh, considerable uh, impact on growth. And, uh, you know, it, it is really in those countries that are furthest from the, the border, as we, we might uh, call it, that are, have been less, less successful in pursuing such reforms to date, that one sees the, the highest impact of pursuing uh, those reforms. And those are countries with the greatest structural gaps, as we, we're calling them. So when, when those reforms are implemented in that type of economy, and if they're prioritized appropriately, sequenced appropriately, bundled together, uh, they can, uh, over a two-year period, say, in, in, in those types of economies, make for uh, an increase in growth of uh, 4%, and uh, in, in uh, over a four-year period, 8% uh, 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 increase in growth, which is, which is considerable. Exactly. Uh, so that's, uh, that's really uh, a way of saying uh, that a lot uh, can be gained <coughs> Mm -hmm. by pursuing these uh, uh, first-generation reforms. Mm -hmm. And uh, our research really shows that um, it, uh, the, 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 the importance of sequencing and properly uh, bundling these mm -hmm. reforms. One example I can give is the case of uh, Senegal uh, in the period 2014-2019, uh, uh, when they pursued exactly this uh, package of uh, first-generation reforms and uh, bundled it, uh, and together we're able to then see their growth average about 6.2% uh, over that period. Mm -hmm. So uh, clearly in the world of constrained resources and uh, uh, you know, uh, limited uh, uh, policy space, uh, the fact that uh, pursuing uh, basic reforms can really enable uh, less of a tension between policy choices is, is really what huge. Is, what yeah. is the top three reforms that you would suggest, and, and you think they will be more effective than the others? It, it depends on the country circumstances, mm. but as I was describing the type of economies that have not enabled these reforms at all yet, mm -hmm. or been successful in doing so, reforms on governance, mm -hmm. reforms on the regulatory environment, reforms to external uh, trade, uh, the external sector, can really open the doors to uh, the private sector, creating more confidence mm -hmm. in policy making in those countries that have made some progress on governance, for sure. And uh, of course, uh, making it possible to benefit from imported and possibly cheaper, cheaper uh, inputs into their, uh, 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 you know, product making as well. So mm -hmm. those basic reforms combined can really make a difference in, in developing and uh, emerging markets. Yeah, in low-income countries yes. and emerging markets, they, yeah. they do they do make a big difference. Minister um, uh, Nizar, uh, Morocco has embarked on an ambitious. Um, reform program under the um, new development model. What are the key reform priorities for you today? Um, I have checked um, the um, recent outlook for um, uh, the economy, and the GDP is expected to grow by 3.4 percent this year. Exactly. Which is amazing after the tragic event that took place. Mm. Well, uh, thank you very much. I would like, first of all, to say that, uh, uh, as you said, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's very important for us to, to increase and to accelerate the growth, but the most important is to have to share the growth between all the people and all the regions. And I would like to emphasize that, uh, as other countries, Morocco has to face a lot of uh, very important shocks. We had the COVID shocks. We had the, 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 the war in Ukraine and the impact on inflation. We have also the drought, five years of consecutive drive in Morocco. And uh, we had the, this uh, uh, earthquake in, in El House. Then it, it's not easy to face all these points at the same time. That's why we consider that for us, uh, and that's, it's, uh, it's written in our new model of development uh, and shared by all the people, but also it's what we did in our plan of the government, is we have to really uh, lead a lot of, of uh, very important work. We have, first of all, the challenge of equity, the challenge also of uh, giving uh, a very uh, new economy and develop the new economy, the challenge of sovereignty, the challenge, it's very important for us also 
is to talk to about the challenge of sustainability and the challenge of resilience. I would like to say that our three important uh, uh, points we, we are working on, first of all, is about equity. And talking about equity, one of the, one of the big goals we have is to reduce uh, inequity uh, between the regions. And uh, we have now developing the advanced regionalization with new plan of development for each region. And, uh, and, and we have uh, agreement between the government and the region to implement these plans. Second important thing is to reduce, of course, inequity, uh, social inequity. And on this point, we, we develop, you know, a new law of investment when we give to the territories to attract more investments on, on uh, vulnerable territories. And we can go to 30% of bonus of the investment given by, by the country and by the, the, the state. And at the same time, we, uh, we, are, we are, of course, uh, uh, developing a very important project, His Majesty the King uh, decided, is to generalize social protection. I'm talking about health care, uh, health, uh, sorry, uh, health medical care for all the, health care for all the, the people. We have it now. Second important thing is we, we, we will have a, re, a minimum, a revenue minimum for all the, the poor in the country. We will have around 3 million to 4 million uh, poor uh, families will get this money every month to help themselves and to fight uh, poverty in our country. Mm -hmm. And the third important thing I would like to, to talk about is about resilience. And talking about resilience, one of the key challenges we have to face is climate change. Mm -hmm. And I will give you uh, an example of what we did in this government. We knew that, as I said before, we have five, uh, five years of drought, and the region of Casablanca is very impacted because the dam who give uh, water to Casablanca is the dam of Masira. Is, they have only 87 uh, million uh, cubic meters when Casablanca needs 290 million cubic meters. Mm -hmm. Then to, 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 to find the solution, we did the water pipeline of 67 kilometers. We did it in eight months to take water from Subu when the water went to the, to the sea. Then we will take 440, uh, sorry, 400 uh, million cubic meters a year to give water to uh, Rabat, to Kazamlaka, and all the region. Then 12 million people, we guarantee for them uh, the water, uh, drinking water. At the same time, we will launch, and they will begin at the end of this year, a very important plant of desinalization for 300 uh, million cubic meters, and we will use renewable energy. And these uh, plants will, will be used for drinking water, but also for irrigation. That means that at the end, we will have the nexus, water, energy, and food security. Mm -hmm. Excellent work. I just would like to mention here that when we talk about solar power and uh, wind power, uh, Morocco has been progressing so fast uh, within the green transition uh, that you have, although um, you have been hit really hard by climate change, as you mentioned. And I'm going to uh, move to Minister Magdalena. Uh, Minister Magdalena, prior to COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine, uh, Poland was one of the fastest growing countries in Europe in terms of economy. Can you please tell us more about the first generation reforms undertaken in Poland. How did you overcome the political economy constraints and build public support for, for those reforms? It was not an easy job to be done. 
thank you very much for this question and thank you very much for invitation that an, at, and that I can share the Polish success story here with you and uh, the outcome of the reforms. Of course, we are still in the transformation mode because it never ends. If you want to grow, if you want to uh, build your wealth, you are always in some kind of a transformation and challenges are still there. But at the beginning of 90s, Poland was in an exceptional situation because we were one of the poorest countries in Europe, bankrupt with hyperinflation. So that was our start. So definitely we needed very bold, <coughs> deep reforms uh, and we had to make an effort to catch the West, catch up the West, to, 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 build, um, to build our economy, to go from the centralized economy to the open markets, to the modern, um, modern economy. So it all started especially with deep markets reforms, which was not an easy uh, decision to take. And the shape of these reforms, we could, we could have done better because these reforms were really very difficult for, uh, for people, for society, but uh, people understood that there are needed, if we want to be a part of the Europe, the Western Europe, uh, to which we aspired and uh, we wanted to be a, be a part of the European Union, but we could have done better because in this reforms, especially in the market reforms, we uh, didn't much uh, put uh, too, too much um, attention to the poorest one, to the most vulnerable people. And the effect of the reforms was, okay, the opening market, free market economy, uh, and the boom of the private, um, uh, private companies on the one hand, but on the other hand, we had a lot of uh, unemployment. And it took some time uh, to uh, first improve the budgetary position, improve the income come to the budget, uh, make necessary tax reforms, and then to realize a social programs, which were the priority for, for the government. Uh, and now the situation is uh, much, much better with unemployment uh, around uh, 3%. Uh, so, but this was maybe a mistake. Uh, we should take more attention to the protective measures uh, within the reforms. But for Poland, the main anchor for the reform was the EU accession and NATO accession. And this was also a very good political uh, motivator for, of also for people, for societies, not only for governments which uh, realized uh, the reforms. And very important part of those accession um, is, uh, issues and uh, uh, tools was the EU funds. Uh, we uh, had a possibility have had the possibility to use the EU funds and it allowed Poland to build strong institutions uh, to invest in infrastructure which is necessary if you want to have investors if you want to have an economy growing but very very important element on which I would like to stress is the education education was also a key for a future success and uh, people not only governments but people people knew that the education is a key for a better future. And now, nowadays, we can uh, uh, like, uh, ha have, the, have this success for the global companies investing in Poland, uh, in uh, our research and development hubs, in ICT, uh, in new technologies, because they use the skilled, skilled people with a special, really, I must say, uh, sometimes unique attitude of people uh, to work. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, t taking into account our lessons, I would say that it is very important to have an anchor for reform. For Poland, as I said, it was a new accession, it was a NATO accession. But sometimes uh, these anchors might be uh, different. Like, for instance, IMF programs, like national strategies, if they are broadly accepted, broadly agreed, and um, agreed also by, by the society. Uh, this is an important uh, issue. Also, the uh, um, the, uh, the, the reforms, they sh should be structured mm -hmm. and also sequenced. Mm -hmm. This is also very important to have a plan how to, uh, how to do this step by step. Mm -hmm. And for Poland and from my experience, I must say that it is very important to keep growth, to, uh, to also to realize reforms, is to have a strong regional cooperation. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our case, of course, this is the EU, but not only, it is also some regional uh, cooperation on the level of Visegrad countries, this is the V4 initiative, uh, but also Weimar Triangle with France and 
Germany, and also a free seas initiative. This, uh, this is the initiative for the region from the Mediterranean already to Baltic Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, square meters and a lot of uh, inhabitants mm -hmm. and also a lot of challenges mm -hmm. uh, nowadays. Um, Minister, we all know that uh, Poland has been very supportive of Ukraine during the war. Uh, you have um, supplied military aid, you have received millions of refugees, uh, and that did cost you around 3.5% of your GDP. How do you describe the economy today? Uh, it is, of course, it is something which had to be done and has to be done uh, also as far as uh, the war is there and uh, Ukraine needs our support and we are there to, to support them. Uh, uh, yes, exactly. We have uh, received uh, permanently in Poland stays uh, around one million of uh, Ukrainian people. But fortunately, we have a very good employment uh, situation. Labor market is strong and we could um, uh, have these people uh, working. And and uh, like 60, more than 60% of those who are in the working age, they work. Mm -hmm. This is also due to the similar culture, to the similar language. So it's not only the cost uh, for the economy that we uh, 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 that we supply help at the beginning for, for those refugees, that we supply humanitarian aid, military aid, uh, but this is also uh, people who are working, who are part of our society. Of course, hopefully they will return to Ukraine when the war is uh, over. Um, and, and fortunately also for Poland, uh, we, um, uh, Russia and Ukraine were not our main trading partners, mm. especially Russia, because we expected what can happen uh, and we um, uh, quite uh, sooner um, diversified our supplies, especially uh, of, the, of the raw materials, of the oil, fossil fuels and, and gas. So we were, <laughs> I must say, prepared, uh, better prepared than the rest of, of Europe for what might have happened and what finally unfortunately happened. Uh, and on, on that note, um, Poland was uh, dependent around 60% of its energy supply before the war and now they're at zero from yeah. Russia, right? Uh, we're, we're moving to a different point, uh, DMD, uh, Antoinette, uh, despite their um, low carbon footprint, um, fast growing, emerging and developing countries, um, now they contribute more to uh, global carbon emissions. How can macrostructural reforms that you mentioned can help with the green transition and probably to balance the challenge of today, the energy trilemma, uh, finding secure, affordable, and clean energy, and fight climate change? Yeah, no, uh, you've put your finger on the, on the crux of it all, right? Uh, we were previously talking about, of course, the, the constrained uh, uh, policy environment for all of these countries, given these different, uh, 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 given the, the, the global environment of uh, slower growth, of uh, their own constrained policy space and uh, uh, inability to invest uh, in the ways that would support their growth and, and protect their most vulnerable. Put on top of that, of course, their need to contribute uh, to the decarbonization effort. Uh, all countries uh, uh, have to be part of that. And uh, that, that makes for additional, uh, you know, uh, uh, challenges for these countries to manage that are extremely uh, difficult. Um, and it, it, uh, but there's good news, actually, uh, in, in light of uh, the discussion of first-generation reforms we, we were having, that those, those reforms, in fact, can really do a lot to enable uh, green reforms and to, uh, to, to, in, in, uh, to make sure that uh, both green reforms and uh, uh, first-generation reforms together make for more robust growth, at the same time as helping to contribute to decarbonization. Uh, why is that? Because, you know, I, as I said before, those initial uh, reforms can really uh, ignite growth. And so you have a situation in which a country is uh, very, very eager to do its part to contribute to uh, decarbonization. But of course, in an environment, a very charged political environment, say, where people uh, believe that uh, the authorities are not making enough of uh, endowed resources, say, in petroleum, not exploiting pet petroleum be uh, uh, in a robust way because they do want to uh, make their own contribution. Well, that initial prop, uh, uh, you know, propelled growth from those first generation reforms 
can give governments a bit more political space mm -hmm. uh, to show that, yes, there is growth from another source in the economy that we're enabling to make sure that that growth then uh, helps to you know, transition workers that may be affected by not pursuing petroleum investments and uh, you know, gives them that space, that political space, first of all. It gives them also fiscal space because in growth comes with it increased revenues and those revenues can then be used to invest uh, in new jobs uh, and uh, to, to make sure that uh, investments in, in green uh, activities can proceed. So uh, just really to, to say that it, it's a win-win when you have uh, uh, those first reforms and at the same time pursuing uh, 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 green reforms. Um, now, first, uh, you know, first uh, uh, generation reforms by themselves uh, on average will uh, emit uh, uh, contribute uh, to emissions, right? Uh, because there's growth and it, yes. it, it adds to that. Uh, so, but if you're able to pair that with uh, investments in, in green, uh, green activities, uh, that will help to mitigate uh, that, uh, the, uh, that impact of that uh, growth. So they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, makes for, it makes it possible for, con for countries to pursue both uh, uh, their growth strategy uh, and uh, their contribution to decarbonization. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, they also, and how do they you know, pair that? Of course, as we said before, as I was saying before, the fact that the enabling environment is improved for the private sector, better governance, making policies more credible, uh, freer trade, uh, uh, le fewer re restrictions on trade, making it possible to benefit from imported technology on, on the green side, for example. All of those things make the, uh, the private sector be better able to make the decisions to shift uh, to, to green investments and to do it in a way uh, where they're comfortable that uh, you know, they're not going to be second guessed from one week to another with changes in government policies. Mm -hmm. So those basic reforms are essential to make it possible for the private sector to play a robust role also in the, uh, the transition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Minister Nizar, um, during your first answer, you, you actually talked um, to us about different projects, green projects that you um, do here in Morocco. And um, we know that you have been doing amazing on the uh, green uh, energy front. Mm. Recently, Morocco uh, has secured $1.3 billion funding under the IMF Resilience and Sustainability Trust. Yeah. Uh, and that's, of course, to uh, boost uh, um, the long-term efforts to build resilience and uh, to external shocks uh, and ensure sustainable growth. What are the potential risks or trade-offs associated with the pursuing growth and the green transition at the same time? Well, uh, first of all, I would like to say that for us it's very important to have this line. As you know, we are, the only, we are very few countries having this opportunity to have this line. And we just have from, from, uh, from uh, the IMF other important line, the flexible line, for five billion dollars for any shocks we can, we can have. And uh, why it's very important to have it? Because first of all, that means that there is a real trust on what we are doing and on the field of, uh, of the green economy. Second important thing is that uh, it came on time, because as, as I said before, we have a very pro big challenge with climate change. The impact of climate change in our country is huge. I would like to say that uh, you know the water for, 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 for per capita, it moves from 2060 uh, and 600 uh, uh, cubic meters a year for each uh, citizen by 20, in, 20, in, uh, in 1960 to now 600 and three uh, uh, cubic meters, and we are moving to 500 uh, cubic meters by, uh, 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 for each person uh, for a year. That's, that means that, we, and, and there is a lot difference between, between the places in the country. That's why it's very important to have this, this, uh, this money to finance these kinds of projects. And I would like to say, we all know, and uh, Mrs. Uh, said it before, the big challenge for us, for our countries, is to, to find money for adaptation. 
And as you know, the big problem for adaptation is metrics, because for mitigation is clear, the metrics, how we can see exactly the impact. For adaptation is more difficult. Then with this uh, line, we will finance these kinds of projects, and I'm talking about projects on water, projects, for example, on reuse, on, on uh, we have, of course, desalination plant, also on demand to have uh, uh, water efficiency. We are talking about decarbonation of the industry, is one of the big projects we have in our country. Our, our ports also, we are doing a, a program for decarbonation of the ports. Mm -hmm. We are talking also about our uh, national strategy of uh, uh, sustainable development, uh, and it will be very uh, important to, uh, to, to, to do this strategy and on, to implement the strategy on the, with the regions, because the most important is to have also a territorial approach, because the, the, uh, the, the difficulties in the territories are different. And at the end, I would like to say that, uh, because, to answer to your question, uh, to say that, of course, we consider that it's very important to have to increase the growth, because we need more jobs, but it's also important to do it on the sustainable way. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Let's bring in money now. BlackRock <laughs> is on stage with us. Financing has been the most important challenge to do anything in this world. And investors is not going to move and do any investment unless they have a guaranteed returns. I know that um, bringing green financing um, has been very challenging, especially for emerging and developing countries. And I was always interested to understand how you convince investors to do uh, investment in the green space and how much the percentage of the total investment worldwide. Well, that's a very difficult question. You're starting with, <laughs> with a tough one. But thank you very much, first of all, for, for inviting me, DMD, uh, Saya. And, and honored to be with you, ministers. Listen, I mean, let me start with the basics, if you don't mind. Let me step back, and I'm, I promise I'll get back to your question directly, which is how do you enhance financing in, in transition, right? How do you make it easier, right? And let's sort of first contextualize the number, to contextualize the, the, the problem, right? How, it's a big problem, right? Sort of, this is a becoming, a, sort of the existential issue, is how do you finance transition? Uh, and and sort of when we did our numbers a few, few months ago, which, by the way, the IMF came up with, some, with, with another set of numbers over the weekend, uh, similar, the numbers are really large. You're talking about roughly, just for emerging markets outside China, you're talking about rough, roughly no, $1.9 trillion every year between now and 2050. Well, that's a huge number, right? And clearly, the fiscal space and the credit worthiness of most of the countries that need that kind of money is simply not available. Right? Their the ability, money is not available, or we have the money, but it's not accessible. The fiscal space, the ability of the public sector to shoulder that magnitude of funding, especially when there are alternative and other equally needed uh, reasons, not least of which is poverty alleviation, income inequality, dealing with those most in need of financing. right? The money cannot come from the public sector. It's difficult to see the public sector shouldering this burden. Mm. So the problem is enormous, and chances are it's the private sector is going to have to, have to be asked to step in and, and, and at least try to cover it, which really raises the question of, first of all, are we doing our job? Is the private sector stepping up? And sort of there's good news here, right? And I think sometimes it goes um, unnoticed, is that it's not like the private sector is not already involved. Right. If I step back away from, from green financing, to generalize it, before I get into the green bond market, emerging market financing is already 26% of the global bonds market at this point is accounted for in emerging markets. Right? The amount of, of stock of outstanding debt that is issued by emerging markets and owned by the private sector in international markets, right? It's around $3 trillion in hard currency and another 3 and a half in local currency. These are internationally issued bonds. So, so there's roughly $6.5 trillion worth of financing already given to the publics, to the emerging markets by the private sector. So the notion that the private sector is not there 
is not, I mean, sometimes it's sort of, and that market incidentally is already quite transparent, institutionalized, liquid, it right, has gone through significant amount of, of, of volatility and has survived. Does that transcend into the green bond market? Like right? yeah. sort of moving away from generalized funding into, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is that the amounts are still very small. The amount of green bonds that exist right now for emerging markets outside China is only 450 billion. So just compare the number. You need one and a half, we need 1.9 trillion every year, and the stock outstanding is 450. Not even a quarter of one year's needs. That's exactly. the bad news. Because we're talking trillions, and here we're talking millions. <laughs> and this is stock versus flow. Yes. Right? Very, very big difference, right? The market itself is also still has significant imperfections, right? Issues of transparency, um, issues of labeling, um, issues of ra what rating agencies consider to be climate effectiveness and impact, um, transparency over, over, over the metrics that are being used. A lot of that money doesn't go into climate financing, it goes into other forms of the ESG. Still significant amounts of work that, has been, that is needed, right? Um, so that's unfortunately the, the problematic, is that the amounts are very small and we still need to develop that market before we get. The good news, however, is that there is a way. Just like in the 90s, we developed emerging markets financing, there is a way. And the only way to make it work is to have more of a partnership between the public sector and the private sector. We need to work together to come up with better regulation, better transparency, more focused projects, um, scalable projects, Mm. and projects that are part of a more comprehensive national program and not ad hoc one-off. Mm. Right. So the problem is enormous. We're the only ones who can, I think, fund it. The starting point is very small, but there's a way out. Mm -hmm. So if I ask you about the top three things that policymakers in, in, in those countries should do now in order to position their economies as attractive destinations for green investment, what would they the be? top three. So, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm, the first is by far the most important. Go back to basics. Which is? Capital markets, private, borrow, private lenders are scared, right? We, in Arabic, we say khawif, right? Rasul ah. khawif, for those who are watching us in Arabic, right? We, we need certain assurances and guarantees, right, at the end of the day. And those assurances are partly macroeconomics, and so stability becomes extremely important, exchange rate risk, interest rate risk, right? Credit worthiness, default risk, but also the structure, the kind of things that DMD mentioned, the first generation reforms that permits the returns to be sufficiently high for us to be attracted. Mm. So the basics are significant. Once you do the basics, once you do the stabilization and the reform, chances are, as you, again, you gave the example of, of, of Senegal, right? But there are multiple other examples. Poland is another example. Morocco is another example where once the work is done, the money does show up, right? The next two, other, if you want, so the next step becomes relatively technical. This becomes about regulatory reforms, yes. transparency, governance, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of financial engineering, like the importance of coming up with instruments, working with the multilateral development banks to come up with hybrid instruments where they guarantee the first loss. There are solutions, but the first is the basics. Thank you very much. So now, at least there's one, one takeaway from what you said. Uh, they need to get the job done and done right, hmm. and then investors will come in uh, because, um, as, I, as I mentioned when we started, and please uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong, if you don't have a stable country, no one will come and invest. And if you don't uh, um, present a solid project, no one will invest. And investors, please correct me if I'm wrong, they don't care about green transition. They care about how much money they will take in return and when it's done for a good cause. No, I'm, I'm gonna, if you don't allow me, I'm gonna sort of deviate a little bit from the question, which is slightly loaded. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so there is increasingly, and this is a very powerful trend that you're seeing in finance right now, between the strong and the not strong. Mm -hmm. The markets, so the way you framed it, Lomi, at the, at the beginning, where we're working, we're living through a very difficult macro environment, higher interest rates, strong dollar, uh, tighter liquidity, slower growth, right? Um, China that is not recovering as fast as we thought, we thought, right? 
Now, this market is um, problematic for emerging markets. However, the, the evidence is in the last two years, if you're a strong country, mm. if you're a strong borrower, both corporates and sovereigns, if you have strong balance sheets, if you are, if, the market is open for you. And but the measure of risk, the, the concept of the, the spread that we charge to countries that are strong, right, they're, they're what we call investment grade, is as low as it's ever been. Despite all these problems, that we, the, the, the headwinds we talked about, spreads on investment grade credit is still as low, uh, historically quite low. The problem, unfortunately, is on the vulnerable names. Mm. So that, that tale of two, creditor, two debtors is an important point, is important, uh, that is more obvious today than it's been for, for, for a while. But don't you agree that there's so untapped potential in the emerging and developing countries and the growth rate would probably be much higher than developed countries? That's, uh, absolutely, that's always been the case. It's always been a play, a game on convergence. Mm -hmm. It's always been a game of countries who have higher productivity, um, excess labor, um, um, in a word, and, 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 but, but are scarce of capital. So the idea was always to absorb the capital into higher rate of return in a growing entities, countries, and then, and then and that's where the convergence plays out. And that theory, to my mind, that hypothesis still applies, and that's going to be at the, at the core of the green, of the transition financing. Mm -hmm. We need to create the environment where we can show that that return is there and the money will show up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, going back, uh, DMD, uh, Antoinette, to the uh, IMF paper, uh, one of the uh, important points that you have raised is uh, digitalization. Mm -hmm. And investment in digitalization could yield significant dividends, including higher revenue collection and efficiency in spending, improved outcomes in education, health, social safety nets. What role do structural reforms play in a country's digitalization efforts? Yeah, no, this is a, a very uh, good uh, question <laughs> because, uh, you know, uh, countries are extremely, uh, very, very eager uh, to digitalize and to, uh, to benefit from digitalization, understandably so, given the potential benefits that, that, that it has. And uh, so, you know, we, we have quite a bit of uh, dialogue with our country authorities currently on all of that. And from the policymakers' perspective, of course, they see the potential benefits from, say, uh, you know, financial inclusion uh, that uh, is clearly, you know, been enabled by digitalization. Uh, also, just the delivery of basic uh, social services. We saw in the pandemic a number of countries do very well by, uh, you know, you know, trans uh, transferring uh, uh, money, uh, cash uh, benefits to uh, their poorest uh, uh, citizens to help them uh, navigate the pandemic. So it's, it's clearly uh, beneficial and countries are eager to jump on the wagon of digitalization. Uh, and, uh, you know, at, but it's costly, it's also costly. There are still 2.7 billion people with uh, no access uh, and uh, our, our estimates at the fund suggest that uh, the cost of uh, digitalization infrastructure in low-income developing countries could be as high as 3.5% of GDP, mm -hmm. which is considerable. So uh, to embark on a very uh, costly endeavor, clearly you want to make sure that the benefits will be maximized. So the way to do that is to really pursue these basic uh, uh, first-generation reforms, uh, because they will, help, they will enable the benefits to materialize and to be amplified. Uh, and you know, it's, it's important to focus on digitalization, no question about that. But by itself, it's not enough. Uh, the enabling environment has to be ad adequate. Uh, you know, the, 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 the governance issues have to be properly uh, tackled and dealt with. Uh, the basic uh, structural reforms around, uh, you know, uh, uh, trade restrictions being removed, enabling investments in electricity to be able to use your digitalization uh, infrastructure is essential. So. Uh, that, that really has to be a package. It, uh, it is not enough to just focus on digitalization by itself. So uh, we have uh, very much been uh, focusing with our country authorities on putting in place the basic uh, uh, fundamentals also to make sure that uh, they have those in place uh, before you impose upon that structure that has not been reformed at all, a digital infrastructure that then can actually enable corruption, enable the things that you're trying to, uh, to, to uh, avoid. 
so uh, one example that is prominent in my own mind as a previous uh, policymaker is in the public finance uh, uh, management sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, there, of course, uh, in low-income and fragile states in particular, uh, very weak PFM, as we call it, public financial management systems. And, uh, you know, uh, of course, countries are very interested in, in, in uh, increasing the efficiency of their payment systems. So the move uh, to integrated financial management information systems is, is very much there and uh, very much <coughs> want. Uh, donors sometimes are, are eager to have countries uh, quickly adopt IFMIS. And the problem is if you do that without having put in place the basic reform on the PFM side, basic accounting, uh, basic regulations, you, you really uh, risk uh, those systems being you know, uh, misused. And we've seen examples of those being misused in a number of countries. I will not name countries who suffered from that, but it is, it is the case that one has to pay very close attention to those foundational reforms to make uh, proper use of these uh, digitalized mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure. Thank you. So speaking of those, uh, Minister Magdalena, Poland has a dedicated GovTech. Uh, it's a department under the prime minister uh, in fact, one of the solutions to fix bugs in the uh, country's tax collection system came from a hackathon that uh, the government organized. Tell us more about this GovTech that you have and uh, how, did, how did this improve the services for your citizens? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Yes, we, we, we use this GovTech. This is the cross-ministerial initiative uh, under the supervision of the prime minister. And this is the idea to connect uh, governmental side, uh, but I mean uh, broad governmental, not only the central government or ministries, but also local government, mm -hmm. with uh, the institutions like non-governmental, technology institutions, and others to create a value added uh, uh, to the technology technology uh, used uh, for the society, for schools, for hospitals, but also for uh, public uh, services. And in the frame of this initiative, uh, what we use also to lower costs, but to give a chance to the young, talented people uh, to be a part of technology, of innovation, and of the growth of the country, um, we organize hackathons. Hackathons, this is the uh, solving problem competition for, for, for young people, and it's already for several years um, each year uh, the edition and Minister of Finance is taking an active part there and due to this uh, problem solving we, we define problem and then uh, the, those young people they seek uh, solution and they are very uh, they open uh, minds of uh, administration really because this is a completely different point of view uh, the, the, the finding uh, sometimes very surprising solutions for, for quite uh, challenging problems and one of those problems Problems was the uh, ceiling of the tax system and tax system reform, uh, combating with uh, VAT frauds, carousing uh, with uh, the tax uh, tax crime. And uh, the, um, a good example of one of those systems is the use of artificial intelligence uh, into the customs border protection and controls. Um, there is a system which is called OCO. It is an AI, and this is the um, as artificial int intelligence uh, we used to analyze the scan of the uh, x-ray uh, at the crossing border points, uh, trucks, uh, containers, uh, and due to this uh, help for the control and uh, tips from the artificial intelligence, we already uh, made uh, more than 8 million uh, savings, let's say, on uh, cigarette uh, smuggling. Uh, so this is already working. This, uh, the solutions from the GovTech, they also work in the data analysis, and um, this is very very important for tax administration because it allows you to have a very effective risk analysis. And then due to the new instrument, due to the data analysis, we could lower the number of physical controls. So the 
things which d uh, disturb your operation as a business. Um, uh, from uh, we had in 2015 150,000 uh, controls yearly, and uh, last year 22,000 controls. Mm -hmm. Much more effective, which more uh, money <laughs> at stake, uh, but directed to those who broke the law, no, to, not to those who want to uh, do uh, uh, their business. So this is a win-win. GovTech is a win-win situation because it allows on one side to build a modern uh, modern administration, which also uh, does service for public uh, in a modern way, in a digital way. This is. At the end, this is an investment, but at the end it pays off. Uh, but also for the startups, for SMEs, for those who use the technologies and they have the ideas, mm -hmm. and they can sell those ideas to the government, but also uh, they can uh, grow, uh, because this is a very good way to, uh, to, to be more uh, better in the technologies and uh, just to build a, a better state after all. Thank you, Your Excellency. Minister Nizar, I would like to give you the last word. Mm. I know that the immediate priorities today for Morocco is actually centered uh, around reconstruction and assisting those affected uh, by the tragic earthquake. Yeah. How can you do that on one hand and at the same time on the other hand, you need to accelerate structural reforms to guarantee a sustainable growth for the country. Well, I would like first of all uh, to thank the, the World Bank and the IMF They maintain the assembly here in Marrakech. I would like to thank you all to be here with us because it's a real solidarity with us and it's very important for us. And I would like to say that, uh, as you said, the first point for us uh, was, and the, by the leadership of His Majesty the King, was uh, to, to give assistance to the people who have been affected by the earthquake, but also uh, to, uh, to rebuild. And uh, now our goal is not only to rebuild, but we would like to rebuild it better. And more than that, we would like to develop all these regions. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, we are working on three important uh, things. First of all, we will create an agency of the High Atlas who will manage, have the governments, and to give transparency for all the funds who they will be uh, mobilized to do uh, this uh, program of development of these regions. Second thing, we are preparing a real integrated program of development. His Majesty the King uh, decided that we will mobilize $12 billion to do this project in five years. Third important thing, we focus more on citizens, on people, how to have a better life, how we can develop new uh, uh, companies here and give them opportunity to develop new economic activities like ecotourism, like, uh, uh, of course, agriculture, transformation, industries. And uh, at the end, and at the same time, that's the, the, the I think, the, the, the goal is also to maintain uh, the region like it is because it's very important to get to maintain the specificity mm -hmm. of these houses and uh, we, we, re, we would like to rebuild them with and they will rebuild them by, the, by themselves uh, respecting uh, uh, say, uh, anti seismic uh, uh, effort but at the same time it's very important to maintain the cultural uh, capital in, in the region because we consider that the immaterial capital is very important here and as you said it's also very important to do it on the sustainable way that's why all the plan we are preparing include water include uh, in uh, protecting environment include also all what is in charge of, of human development mm -hmm. thank you thank you minister and thank you for having us um, um, and we really appreciate the uh, Moroccan hospitality. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here, for making the time. We very much enjoyed listening to you. Uh, let's hear a round of applause for our distinguished speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's thank you for you.